it is my great pleasure to warmly welcome uh, my good friend uh, colleague uh, professor in jide okubadejo from uh, world famous uh, lagos university nigeria uh, i came to know about ngd thanks to palatuchi advocacy forum as uh, i was supposed to be her advisor for the uh, palatuchi advocacy course uh, of course uh, being her mentor was uh, was such an easy job as uh, she already had uh, everything that she needed to get going in jide very warm welcome to you thank you tisa so um i'm really excited to be here thank you for having me and thank you for your mentorship in the aan palatishi program it really set me on the right path um to in my career thank you, uh, you so much you're most welcome you are not alone in fact when i look around uh, the impact of palatuchi forum uh, globally is unbelievable today though we are going to talk about a few other things as you are aware i know that you are very passionate on movement disorders and parkinson disease in particular you do know that uh, the world federation neurology uh, and movement disorders society joining these two massive forces together to advocate for parkinson's disease uh, with the ambitious agenda of uh, ending parkinson's disease how excited are you to see this campaign and be part of this uh, game changing advocacy activity so thanks i was really excited when i saw that the wfn had decided to shine the focus on movement disorders and particularly parkinson's disease this year you recall that last year it was headache and i at that time i was already wondering to myself that it's really high time that we focus on parkinson disease not because of just because of the numbers of people affected but because in terms of neurological diseases it's the one with the fastest rise in terms of the numbers affected and the potential for even more people to be affected by it in the years to come and also because definitely the wfn recognized the role that the international parkinson disease and movement disorder society has played globally really in reaching out to physicians allied physicians allied health practitioners and patients and their caregivers um, with respect to movement disorders education and training globally so i was really excited to find this merger because i think it's the strongest way of getting the message across this year thank you and jide the i totally agree you have an enormous responsibility including our other friends and colleagues in african continent uh, just as uh, equal importance as in asia oceania region where i live this is where most of the world population live the two two regions the what is your request uh, or message to your colleagues uh, in uh, africa in particular i know that you chair the movement disorder section for that region and you also hold uh, the leadership uh, positions in uh, world wfn as well for your colleagues in african academy neurology as well as uh, movement disorder society chapters and other countries even without uh, uh, those chapters lot happening in africa as i have been watching over last 10 15 years how can they use this uh, fabulous uh, global advocacy opportunity to promote further better neurological care for the region what is your request to them so i think this is a really unique opportunity to throw the focus and change our focus to public awareness about the existence of parkinson disease so one of the things that has plagued um, the african continent as i also recognize is the same in the underrepresented areas of the world is that there's a misconception about parkinson disease so i think this is a really unique opportunity to help the uh, public become more aware about what parkinson disease is who can be affected how it can be managed and how people can be supported while they live with this um, condition so i think that with the present circumstance that we find ourselves in where we're doing a lot of virtual um connections where we're using social media even more even in africa and other areas this is a really strong opportunity for many people to be reached also for many more people to participate um this, this different from the typical scenario where you would have to have in person interactions during a celebration of this sort so 
I want to encourage my colleagues to find ways of reaching the public with the message um, that the WFN has put together. Also emphasizing the fact that Parkinson's disease is not normal aging. Emphasizing the fact that, you know, it's not only your old people that are affected, that younger people can also be affected with Parkinson's disease. And also getting the message across that there is treatment available and that there are plans in place to continue to improve the access of everyone across the world to these treatments. Uh, absolutely, and the, the, the theory and the, the uh, vision and mission behind World Brain Day campaign is uh, brain matters, of course, and we want uh, brain health to be the supreme wealth uh, worldwide. Uh, we do suffer, that, that's the leading cause of uh, disability worldwide, uh, and second leading cause of death. And this pandemic is such an eye-opener for all of us to put where brain should be. So let's encourage uh, all our colleagues in African continent to visit uh, World Federation Neurology website, visit Movement Disorders Society website. Uh, both website uh, has uh, fabulous uh, educational material and toolkit. Uh, the WFN toolkit is basically, it is for everybody. People can download them, translate into their language, uh, add their logos, uh, make it their own, and uh, the use that material to promote uh, awareness campaigns uh, in that region. And you, you, you're absolutely right. I think the critically important thing is raising awareness. This concept of uh, Parkinson's disease is part of normal aging is uh, even exists in Melbourne, let alone right. being such a well-developed city. So the, we all have a lot of work to do. And certainly where my, uh, the, the, the country where I was born, Sri Lanka, is, is exactly the same as well. So th thank you for those comments and we wish you and your colleagues uh, in African continent and our friends and colleagues all over the world to have the most fabulous World Brain Day campaign despite this pandemic. Uh, and I'm so excited to see the enthusiasm of our colleagues. If some of our world political leaders thought that they would divide us and conquer, I think the scientific community had other ideas. We have connected right. with each other like no other. I mean, I'm talking to you from other end of the world. And we are right. basically right. Sh sharing this message across the world. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident that uh, the future is going to be optimistic. Uh, humans would prevail with good human qualities. Uh, I'm going to change the, 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 the direction of this discussion to a different angle now. You are a okay. unique uh, person and you are, a, you are such an inspiration, not only for neurologists uh, and uh, those uh, young men and women in particular, in African continent to pursue a career in academic world and pursue a career in medicine, pursue a career in neurology, of course. I would like to know a little bit about your childhood and what sparked you to be interested in medicine and what sparked you to be interested in neurology and movement disorders. So share your thoughts about it as it is very likely to inspire hundreds of young women and men all over the world when they watch this. So thank you, Tisa. I think I really um, am grateful for all the opportunities that have come my way um, in life. And I really think that um, these things would not have happened, you know, if it was just me trying to get them done. So I want to, I want to just say that I had a lot of help along the way. And working with people, being open to collaborating with people is really what has helped me this far. But back to the question that you're asking. So my background, I'm the last of four children, two mm -hmm. boys, two girls. Um, I come from an academic family. So let me just put it out there that both my parents were professors, one a professor of history and education, and the other one a professor of French. And so my, my um, growing years were spent on university campuses. So I lived in two or three university campuses growing up. And as we got older, my parents, you know, it was clear that they did want one of us to go into academics. And mm -hmm. so I guess the, the owner sort of fell on me. Um, also, because if you, if you know the Nigerian family, most of us, when we were growing up, it was either you were going to be a doctor or an engineer, a lawyer. They insisted you went into a particular profession. So while I was in secondary school, which is high school, when it was time to fill the forms for our university entry exams, it was one or the other. So if you were a science student, you were going to put in for medicine or engineering or something like that. And if you were an arts-oriented student, you were going to put in for law. 
So it, was, it wasn't really something I premeditated getting into medicine. But once I got into it, though, I must confess that I really enjoyed um, studying medicine. It was challenging, it was real, it was practical. And um, so I went to the University of Ife, um, which is one of the top uh, medical schools in Nigeria. And then after that, I tried to go into public, um, private practice, sorry. And I found on the very first day I was in private practice that I could not cope with that scenario. I really needed the academic input um, that I would find if I went into specialist training. So that's what led me to go into training uh, in internal medicine. And just to say that the reason I chose internal medicine was because in medical school, I had some pretty awesome teachers um, who were like very, they would interact with students. They were very, they made us feel that medicine was very exciting. And so naturally I chose internal medicine because that's the specialty that had the greatest impact in my training. Um, so the way our residency training is structured in Nigeria and much of West Africa, you have to enter a program for internal medicine first, and then you can subspecialize in any of the specialties. So I entered with the intention of becoming a cardiologist because that's what my mentors in medical school were. And also that's what seemed the most lucrative. I saw the cardiologists, they were the ones that were most you know, savvy. They were the ones that seemed to have you know, things going very well for them. Um, I also liked cardiology. So I got in thinking I was going to study cardiology. And when I got to the point where I needed to take the decision as to subspecialty, my head of department at the time looked at the different specialties and realized that there was a gap in neurology. Neurology at, at the time hadn't had a senior registrar, I think, for two or three years. And so she called a couple of us who were due to start our senior residency and basically said, look, one of you has to go to neurology. And the other two said they weren't, that they were determined to study what they came to um, specialize in. So I said, well, why not? I'll take up the challenge. And that's how I actually found myself in neurology. But I must say that I haven't regretted ever since because I find that neurology is one of the specialties. I don't know if many people realize this. So if you're going to choose a specialty that you can practice in a developing country, neurology is probably your best bet because much of your evaluation to a large extent, at least for the commoner um, conditions, starts out with your clinical evaluation and leads you at least to the point where you can start to offer the patient some type of treatment based on that clinical judgment. So I really enjoyed that because I was practicing in a place where patients may not have the funds for elaborate investigations and so forth. So I enjoyed that. And then I had to then think about subspecializing within neurology. And it was really serendipitous that I ended up in movement disorders again. My mentor at the time, who was a professor of neurology, um, had asked me to think about what topic I needed, I, I, I wanted to um, take on for my dissertation, um, which was part of the requirements for the fellowship. And it was Parkinson's disease at the end of the day. And it was something that prior to then, nobody was focusing on it um, in, my, in my, where I was working. The patients didn't seem to be in the clinic, but believe me, thereafter, once we started focusing on Parkinson's disease, the patients started coming. And then other movement disorders patients started coming. So that was how I really ended up in movement disorders. And I really love it. Again, it's very practical, very exciting. It's a specialty where if you know what you're looking for, it's much easier. If you don't know what to look out for, it may seem like a real mystery. But really, um, if you get into it, it's really straightforward, um, fairly you know, easy to understand, and very practical also. So that's how I ended up with movement disorders. That's, that, that's your journey. So you, you basically had a, a good ride, and you had support uh, all along the way. In, in the medical did. school, the, the, did you have any problem because you were a woman uh, with regard to academic activities or other things, so you did not uh, face any such barriers uh, in the medical school or throughout the training? Okay, so in medical school and in my subsequent training, I would say that the barriers were there, but for me personally, 
I, I, when I look back, I realized that I simply ignored those barriers. I think what helped me was because I had um, been, I, I came out from a family where there was absolutely no distinction regarding whether you were male or female, even though in the larger society, I would hear things like that from my colleagues um, about you know, how men and women were being treated differently within their families. But from my family, there was no such thing. So I, I had a, a I, I guess it was a defense because I completely ignored it. But the barriers were certainly there, but I didn't pay them any attention. It's, it's, it's interesting, <laughs> as you know, I grew up in a fairly rural Sri Lanka and I have uh, three sisters and one brother. I am the eldest in the family. My mother was adamant that there's absolutely no difference between you and your sisters. Everything that happens in the kitchen, everybody has to do. Everything that has happened outside the kitchen, everyone has an equal go. No one is uh, uh, superior or inferior. So we grew up uh, even in, in that rural city with uh, equality uh, at, uh, at, at, at that time. Uh, the, did you have other uh, female uh, medical students or neurology trainees uh, who could not overcome such issues? Or as far as you are aware, while there were issues, uh, they still kept fighting and kept... Uh, uh, the, the, the working along their course. Right. So in medical school, something I noticed and I still continue to notice is that the, the girls fight harder. I've right. noticed that. So I found that if we had a group meeting, the girls tried to be in front, even as residents, even with my uh, residents now, I find that the females, they fight harder. I think that's because you know, there's that perception that they have to fight harder to prove themselves. So that is there. Also, when I, after I became a neurologist and also while I was training, I realized that in, as, as women tried to pursue their professional career, they also had the dilemma of balancing that with their family life. And that family life is whether it was their parents who expected them to help look after the family, or whether they had become married and had children. So it was, I realized that it was much more difficult for women um, to forge a career. So the consequence um, for some of my colleagues was that they were then slower in progressing in their careers, or they had more difficulty passing their exams, or they had to take breaks in their career when you know the family needed support or when children were born. And the consequence sometimes was that some of them would not be able to come back to the residency training to complete if the family life was too overwhelming for them. So certainly there are unique challenges that women pursuing an academic career face and a clinical career face in medicine and in neurology. I, I like to combine uh, your this answer and previous answer together to drive home the message of importance of collaboration. Uh, every time I'm, I'm doing series of interviews like this, and every time when a successful uh, man or woman share their personal story, the overarching message that I'm hearing is the support that they're getting from their partner. And uh, I mean, we both face uh, this unprecedented pandemic, right? Uh, the, the negative impact of pandemic doesn't have any African, Asian, or American. It's basically against humanity. I think uh, the lessons that I am learning, I'm sure you are learning also, is uh, the importance of uh, working together and supporting each other and looking at the big picture. Uh, the raising yes. a family is hard, and uh, we have to we have to support uh, each other's uh, partners uh, to get the best out of them for themselves as yeah. well as to the world. I think your both answers beautifully articulate uh, that message. Let's hope that uh, we, as humans. Uh, we continue to evolve and continue to be good at that uh, rather than just thinking about uh, ourselves uh, only. The changing directions uh, further, you have been uh, building a very successful career in uh, clinical work as well as research uh, and family. How do you balance uh, these uh, three things together? How do you find time to juggle all these balls uh, without uh, <laughs> dropping them? Yeah, so Tisa, you, 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 you nailed it when you said support. I think the key is support, 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 and on all fronts. So support in the workplace, support at home. Those are really important. So um, in terms of managing my time personally, I think that uh, what I had tried to do was let my family know clearly what my um, career plans are and ensure that 
you know, I didn't separate myself from my family in the in the in my pursuit of my career. So, for instance, when my children were younger, if I if I brought work home, that meant I would come home earlier, but also that meant that I would let them understand that mommy has homework. So while you're doing your homework, I'm doing my homework. We're all in the same um, space. So I tried to, without overwhelming the home with my work, I tried to create an atmosphere where the children and my husband realized that I also had work to do, but I was going to be available to them as I ought to be um, while trying to pursue that career. And they also helped. So everyone also helped to sort of carry their own weight and do their own bit of the, um, the housework. And then as much as possible, when we had free family time together, we tried to maximize those moments and so go out together. And so over the years, they've come to realize that I'm not abandoning them in the pursuit of my career. We're all going along this journey together. That really helped me quite a bit. Same thing for my um, extended family, so my parents and so forth. I had a stint of training in the US and at the time, my dad who was almost 80 at the time, was the one who was caregiving my uh, two-year-old daughter at the time. Mm -hmm. So I've also had that kind of support. I think that what's important is if your family knows what you're pursuing, if they know the benefit of it, if you're respectful also of their own um, goals and aspirations and everybody works together, because at the end of the day, everybody benefits from whatever progress that is made on that front. Thank you for that beautiful answer. Again, I like to remind the audience that uh, the, all the interviews that have done with world experts uh, drive home this message also. Everybody basically, in a nutshell, they tell me how important their family life is uh, to keep things balancing together, although many of them were working 18, 20 hour days, most days, uh, without complaining. And uh, uh, when I ask from them, uh, the, the one thing that they say is uh, how much they adore and enjoy family. And I like to elaborate it further. We should uh, the, everything that you mentioned and every beautiful word that you crafted is relevant for our human family also, especially in the middle of a pandemic. Of course, that's why we chose this provision to help our human family, irrespective of their right. color or the language that they speak or where they come from. And as you said, it's a support, 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 collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. That should be the 21st century competition. If you really want to compete, those of us who really build a very nice collaborative network uh, would go all the way. Those people who think that uh, they would do it by themselves uh, would not go yeah. that far. So, far. Yeah. so outside medicine, NGD, I know that you're about to start your clinic. Uh, and uh, the, 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 what do you do for fun other than uh, uh, the neurology and advocacy? Okay, so, so you want the, the, the truth or the official version? So what do I do for, for fun? I, I watch TV. I, right. like, I like comedies. So right. I think that work is really intense. And I'm one of those people, so I live in a bubble. I don't right. like movies that are scary, that are sad, and so forth. It's so bad. I mean, th there's this movie, uh, Finding Nemo. As, 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 as childlike as that movie is, I couldn't because somebody, Nemo's um, parent had died. So right. I, I like fun movies, um, I like comedies, right. situation comedies, I love those. So I watch TV, I play with my phone, I play um, some brain games, so, I, right. I, so if anything that they say will improve my IQ, I play that, I'm afraid of having dementia, so I try and sort of keep my brain working. Um, basically that's it, I, I, I work out when I can, when I can, might be once in a month. Right, um, right. I like music, right. um, so yeah, that's what I do to have fun and just chatting with friends. Yeah. You mentioned a bit about your family. The any additional thing that you like you like to add uh, with regard to your lovely family? Oh, so I have four daughters, mm -hmm. and so people have said, "Ooh, you don't have a boy," but I'm like, I, I because I didn't grow up knowing the difference between male and female. It has made absolutely no difference. Right. It turns out, though, my four daughters are, you know, they, they are pursuing a career um, like my husband. So my husband is an architect, and my right. first daughter is actually a civil and structural engineer. Mm -hmm. um, and the second uh, set of twins, actually, so I have twins. 
One of them is, has just graduated architecture, and the other one studied visual communication design. And then the last one, um, who's the baby of the family, who's 19, started out saying she wanted to be, go, be an astronaut. And then we convinced her that, well, yeah, that's exciting, but we don't really know how you can become an astronaut from here in Nigeria. Right, and so right. we, we, we navigated that, but she really loves geography. So she's right. studying geomatics at the right, moment. Right, so, right, right. yeah. So the girls, you know, they, 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 they also, I think that we've also brought them up. They don't know the difference really right, between right, uh, right. male and female. They're just doing their thing, yeah. Engineer, it is a pleasure to chatting you. I would like to talk more, but I know that uh, I need to release you to start uh, your busy clinic. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful time. Uh, keep up the good work. Keep inspiring young people, both men and women, and uh, keep working hard. And we wish you and your family all the very best. And we wish uh, all Nigerians and all our colleagues in Africa to have a very successful, productive World Brain Day campaign. As you know, the WFN is working hard with uh, every other neurology association global that is uh, in the context of Global Neurology Alliance to push the agenda that we believe that the problems that humanity is facing with regard to brain health is universal, hence the solutions have to be universal also. And we will all work together to promote this cause that's, a, uh, that's what humanity needs. And this pandemic is a timely reminder how important uh, health and brain health uh, right. uh, is. Thanks once again. Uh, have a good day and uh, all the very best. Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations to the WFN um, for selecting Parkinson's disease as a focus for this year. Thank you so very much for that. It's, Bye -bye. it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. We are all in this together. Well, WFN yes. is you all. <laughs> WFN belongs to everybody. Thank you, Tisa. Thank you very much. And have a lovely day yourself. You too, you too. Bye.